Welcome back, everybody. We're going to talk here about some disorders of the anterior pituitary. Now, we're not going to go into so much physiology here. Um, I talk about that in a, a separate talk. So I'm going to assume you have really good, solid knowledge of endocrine physiology for this talk. All right. So very, very important. Go back and watch that video if you haven't already or if you're shaky on your physiology. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button in the upper right hand corner. I appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already stepped up to donate. And if you haven't, definitely feel free to subscribe to my channel. You'll get updates as I put more and more videos up. I try to put up five videos a week or thereabouts. All right, so the anterior pituitary secretes several hormones, and these hormones are kind of intermediaries. So these hormones don't really uh, do anything as far as the body's physiology. They stimulate other organs to release hormones. So a good example of that is TSH. It doesn't really affect the body, but it tells the thyroid to release T3 and T4. And all these other hormones do something very similar, but in other uh, organs and with other hormones. Um, now, the release of these anterior pituitary hormones is under the control of the hypothalamus, and there are releasing hormones that trigger the release of these various intermediary hormones that come from the anterior pituitary. The mnemonic to remember the anterior pituitary hormones is flat pig. The I doesn't really stand for anything. Um, then there are two other hormones that come from the posterior pituitary, and those are oxytocin and ADH, which we will talk about in another talk. So this is just a little bit about the anatomy. Uh, what I want you to notice here is that there are two lobes, if you will, of the pituitary, an anterior pituitary and a posterior pituitary. Um, and the pituitary is connected to the hypothalamus uh, through this infundibulum, or you may hear it referred to as the pituitary stalk. And this will come into play uh, when we talk about some uh, pathology. Now, the pituitary uh, right underneath it is a part of bone called the cella tersica. It's very, very thin and even difficult to see on MRI. Now, what I also want you to notice is the proximity of the pituitary to the optic chiasm. And remember, that's carrying optic nerves. That's where the uh, parts of the optic nerves will uh, cross the midline. So this is a sagittal view that uh, is right at the midline, which is where you would see the pituitary, and this is the pituitary right here. Now it appears uh, to be sitting right here in the sphenoidal sinus, but it's not actually in the sphenoidal sinus. It is separated from that uh, by the cella tersica, which is uh, a bony uh, prominence uh, that uh, comes from the sphenoidal bone. Uh, so it crosses the midline, it kind of protects the pituitary. Cella tersica means Turkish saddle, so it's kind of a saddle for the pituitary. And here's another view um, you can see uh, again here. Um, so we can label this. This is the pituitary here sitting right next to the sphenoidal sinus. Now what you can see here is uh, kind of a structure going from anterior to posterior right here. Uh, and this is the optic chiasm. And then you can also see this little structure here um, that kind of runs from the pituitary up towards the hypothalamus. And this is the infundibulum or pituitary stalk. And then of course we have midbrain here and pons and medulla. And then uh, and that, that's pretty much your, your entire local physiology if you're looking at a sagittal view. Now, if you're looking at a coronal view, you can see some other structures. Um, so what you see here, this little thin bone here, that's the cella tersica. And on top of that is the pituitary. And what you should see is roughly symmetrical uh, on both sides. So that's the pituitary uh, coming off towards the top running superior to inferior. Uh, this here is the infundibulum. And then it's kind of hard to see here, but right here to right here, that's the optic chiasm. Now, you can also see two vessels coming off right here. Those are in 
internal carotid arteries, and they are within the cavernous sinus, which is kind of right here. Okay, so a little bit of anatomy for you. All right, we're going to talk about a few diseases of the anterior pituitary. We're going to talk about hyperprolactinemia and the various causes of that. We'll talk about acromegaly, and we'll talk about some various disorders that cause panhypopituitarism, which would result in reduced amounts of all of the anterior pituitary hormones. And we'll finish up talking about empty cell syndrome. That anatomy will come back into play. So hyperprolactinemia has a variety of causes. The first one that probably jumps to mind is a prolactinoma, but there are other things. Offending drugs, the big one is antipsychotics. Um, mass effect and trauma can cause disturbance to that pituitary stock or infundibulum. And then hypothyroidism, you're probably wondering what the heck, how does that do it? And we'll get into that, and that's where some of that physiology will come into play. So the first uh, way that you can get this is through a prolactinoma. And in order to get uh, some of these symptoms, besides the high level of prolactin, you would need to have a fairly large prolactinoma. Why is that? Because it will compress the optic chiasm. So that's the optic chiasm right there. And this will typically happen in men. Why? Because men tend to get macroadenomas with prolactinomas, whereas women will tend to get microadenomas, which is less likely to compress the optic chiasm. Either way, prolactinomas secrete prolactin, and so naturally you're going to have a high prolactin level. Pretty simple. Now, an offending drug, uh, such as an antipsychotic, well, what do antipsychotics do? They inhibit dopamine, and dopamine can also be considered prolactin inhibitory factor. And so dopamine inhibits the release of prolactin. Well, if we're blocking prolactin, or sorry, if we're blocking dopamine, we're taking our foot off the brake. And so we're releasing the inhibitor, and so we increase the amount of prolactin. Pretty simple. Now, if you have damage to the pituitary stock, then we have less dopamine making it to the anterior pituitary. And so again, we're taking our foot off the brake and we increase prolactin. And this can happen through trauma. Okay, how about hypothyroidism? How does that work? This is a little bit more complex. So let's say that we have a primary hypothyroidism, so like Hashimoto's. Well, we're gonna have a reduction in T3 and T4 and as you know, T3 and T4 have a negative feedback on the hypothalamus, reducing the amount of TRH. So again, we're taking our foot off the brake here. Low thyroid hormone means more TRH. And TRH not only stimulates the release of TSH at the anterior pituitary, but it also stimulates the release of prolactin. So high amounts of TRH means high amounts of TSH and high amounts of prolactin. Now, what does prolactin do? Well, not only does it increase milk production, as its name implies, but it also will decrease GnRH, which will then decrease LH and FSH. So it can have some effects on the reproductive system, as we'll get to. So the causes we already went over. Dopamine is also known as prolactin inhibiting factor. Um, and so when it's due to an adenoma, when a hyperprolactinemia is due to an adenoma, in women, it tends to be a microadenoma. So you're not typically going to see that uh, bitemporal hemianopsia. But in men, you probably will. Prolactin inhibits the release of GnRH, leading to low LH and FSH, and that's going to result in reduced sex hormones, and that causes some of the symptoms of hyperprolactinemia. So in women, the major symptoms are amenorrhea and galactorrhea. Women have more breast tissue, have more ductal tissue, and so they're going to make milk. It doesn't really happen in men. Uh, they can also get amenorrhea because, as you know, LH and FSH play a big role in the menstrual cycle. Now, in men, it's going to cause gynecomastia, decreased libido due to low testosterone, erectile dysfunction, and the bitemporal hemianopsia if they have an adenoma. If this is due to hypothyroidism or damage to the pituitary stalk, then you're not going to see that. So the best initial test for hyperprolactinemia is simple. It's a prolactin level. The most accurate test is an MRI if we're thinking of an adenoma, 
If we're not thinking of an adenoma, then you wouldn't get an MRI, but an MRI is always good because adenomas are a major cause of hyperprolactinemia. The treatment of choice is cabergoline. Okay, cabergoline. Cabergoline is more commonly used than bromocryptine. You probably learned both of them. If you have to choose on the USMLE which one to use, go with cabergoline. So this is an MRI. Um, what you see here is normal on the left, and then a prolactinoma here on the right. Notice that it protrudes upwards. And where do we see that uh, optic chiasm? Well, here you see it right here. So nice and far away from the pituitary. But here, our pituitary is much larger, and it's very close to the optic chiasm. So you could have some bitemporal hemianopsia if the prolactinoma is large enough. So again, uh, here on the left, what you see is indeed a prolactinoma, and here is our optic chiasm right here, and you can see it is definitely impinged. And then here on the right is the same patient after they've been treated with cabergoline, and you can see that it has shrunk, and the optic chiasm is very nice and non-compressed here. All right, acromegaly is excess GH, or growth hormone secretion, typically due to a macroadenoma. Its onset is usually in the 20s to 40s. The symptoms of acromegaly are primarily related to skeletal changes, and so that'll cause coarsening of the facial features, enlargement of the hands and feet, a deepening of the voice, carpal tunnel syndrome due to changes to the bone, and even congestive heart failure. In children, which we're not talking about here because this is an internal medicine category uh, talk, uh, it will cause something different called gigantism, which is a distinct entity, uh, but primarily because children have not had a closure of the epiphyseal growth plates, they will have uh, growth of the long bones. Um, it'll be, they'll become taller. That does not happen in acromegaly. Once your epiphyses are fused, you're not going to get any taller, even with the influence of growth hormone. But in children, they will get taller. And, you know, that's why some of those freakishly tall people, they likely had gigantism. So this is what acromegaly looks like. Notice the coarsening of the facial features here, prominence of the jaw. Um, they can have prominence of the tongue and separation of the teeth due to a widening of the jaw. Again, here you can see acromegaly in this uh, pa patient here. Notice the changes. You can see particular changes to her face. Uh, you can get these sausage-shaped digits here with acromegaly. Not the same as psoriatic arthritis, but uh, uh, they do get widening of their digits. Um, so notice that. And this is uh, what you would see on x-ray with acromegaly. All right, so the best initial test for acromegaly is an IGF-1 level. And that should be apparent to you if you watched my video on physiology. Uh, but growth hormone stimulates the liver to release IGF-1. And it's actually the IGF-1 that's more active in causing these changes. However, the most accurate test is naturally a growth hormone test, but it's just a little bit more difficult to measure. So the best initial test is an IGF-1. You can think of it as like a screening test. Most accurate is a growth hormone test. Um, and then the definitive diagnosis to diagnose acromegaly is an MRI to visualize the adenoma. Uh, so for treatment, the most effective therapy is a transphenoidal resection. Uh, however, you can try medical therapy. You would use octreotide. That's the best. Um, there are other therapies, uh, cabergoline, which is a dopamine agonist, and pegvisamant, which is a growth hormone receptor antagonist, a competitive antagonist. All right, so this is, again, kind of looking at some physiology here of the uh, of growth hormone. I already went into this. You can get that homonymous hemianopsia, which would look like this. And uh, there are these tests that we went over, the treatment and the medical treatment. And I'm just kind of showing you here uh, how these symptoms arise.
Panhypopituitarism has have a variety of causes. The two big ones are pituitary apoplexy, which is where you get hemorrhage into the pituitary, usually secondary to an adenoma, which uh, is a complication of an adenoma. Uh, you're going to get CNS-like symptoms, headache, nausea, vomiting, altered mental status. Sheehan syndrome is a distinct entity that happens after pregnancy, uh, so after delivery. Uh, it's ischemic necrosis of the pituitary after delivery. It's usually noticed, the first symptom is usually noticed uh, as the woman is unable to breastfeed, and that's due to inadequate production or release of prolactin. And if they're not breastfeeding, what they'll probably notice is that they're not having their period several months after when they should start having their period. That's due to decreased LH and FSH. And then there are a variety of other causes. Okay, so how does panhypopituitarism work? Well, there tends to be an order in which these uh, hormones uh, manifest their deficiencies as far as symptoms. So first it'll be decreased LH and FSH. Now that's convenient because that is pretty symptomatic, particularly in women. They're going to miss their periods. Uh, so amenorrhea uh, will be the most salient symptom. Uh, they're missing their periods. In men, it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, it could be a decreased libido, erectile dysfunction. Always useful to get LH and FSH levels and also prolactin levels in a young younger man who comes in with ED. Um, it's you know it's it's a less common cause, but it could be useful for you to get. Growth hormone deficiency in adults is pretty undetectable. Uh, TSH, here we're talking about a secondary hypothyroidism. You'll have hypothyroid symptoms nonetheless. Uh, and then a decrease ACTH finally. And that's going to be, again, a secondary uh, hypoadrenalism. And so you'll get... Uh, similar symptoms. However, you won't get that increased pigmentation that you see in primary hypoadrenalism, uh, like Addison's disease. Um, you'll have actually a decreased pigmentation because what we have here is an anterior pituitary that's not working. So you're not going to get that melanocyte stimulating hormone that would otherwise cause uh, increased pigmentation in something like Addison's. The best initial test to diagnose hypopituitarism is to just get levels of these anterior pituitary hormones. And there are different ways that we get those. Um, so with LH and FSH, we can measure that directly. With growth hormone, uh, we would get that indirectly via IGF-1, or you can get it directly with that growth hormone uh, response test. And this is how it's done. With TSH, we get that directly. Um, you can also get your thyroid hormone levels to be complete. And ACTH, uh, the release of that would be measured indirectly via cortisol. And I will go into these in future talks when we focus on each of these hormones and their pathologies individually. Uh, so... Uh, you will need to get an MRI in addition to these anterior pituitary hormone levels, and that's to either confirm pituitary apoplexy or to exclude a, a non-functioning adenoma, which can impinge upon the pituitary and uh, reduce the release of these hormones. The treatment is to treat the underlying cause, and you can replace hormone. Uh, for pituitary apoplexy, surgical decompression would be needed. Finally, empty cella syndrome. Now, this is typically an incidental finding. The typical presentation is headache and hypertension in an obese woman. No therapy is needed for this. It tends to be asymptomatic, but it could come up on boards, particularly as a uh, radiology question. So what you would see here, what will give this away is if you get an MRI. Now, remember that there are two types of MRIs. There's T1 and T2. A T1 MRI will cause the cerebral spinal fluid to look dark, and a T2 will cause it to look bright. So what you're going to see here is that the uh, area where the pituitary should be is not going to look the same intensity level as brain tissue, which it should because the pituitary is brain tissue. Um, so notice here, this is normal here on the right, and notice that the pituitary is roughly the same intensity as the brain tissue over here. Well, here it's not. 
Um, so it, here it looks like cerebrospinal fluid, and that's because it is, uh, because you don't have any, you have space there. There's no pituitary. Um, the pituitary is compressed. Uh, so what you have here is it looks just like cerebrospinal fluid, and here it looks just like cerebrospinal fluid because it's empty. Okay, so that is empty cella syndrome, tends to be asymptomatic, uh, but you may see it thrown around on your exam. Just know what it looks like on MRI.